Welcome to the final program in our fall lunchtime seminar series. We will return in 2019 with the spring series hosted by the Wellesley Centers for Women beginning February 28th, so mark your calendars. Uh, today's presentation is The Politics of Respectability, a cross-cultural examination of female bodies and behaviors. Our presenters are Dr. LaShonda Lindsay Dennis and Vivi Thomas. The politics of respectability refers to the ways in which marginalized groups are subjugated to mainstream cultural values by members of their own groups. Today, with LaShonda and Vivi, we will examine how respectability politics influence the lived experiences of girls from diverse cultural backgrounds. We will engage in a critical discussion about how societal beliefs about notions of femininity, respect, and dignity often polices the bodies and behaviors of girls from marginalized groups. LaShonda Lindsay Dennis is a research scientist at the Wellesley Centers for Women. Over the past decade, her research has created a platform that sheds light on the social determinants, racial injustices, and cultural biases that burden the progression and viability of black girls and women. Vivi Thomas, class of 2021, is from North Carolina and the DC metro area. She is currently a Peace and Justice Studies major with a psychology minor, interested in forwarding human rights efforts all over the world, and approaching social justice through a linguistic lens. So thank you all for being here today, and now let's welcome our speakers. Good afternoon. Again, I am LaShonda Lindsay Dennis, the research scientist here at Wellesley Centers for Women. And before we get, begin this program, um, I want to do some kind of cleansing, or some rituals that will help us to kind of get centered in order to um, go forward with this presentation. In a lot of different West African cultures, um, in order to speak in a public setting, you have to ask for permission to speak speak by elders in the room. So, can I have my elders, do I have permission to speak? Yes. Thank you. Um, so thank you today. So we're here today to talk to you about the politics of respectability. So how this presentation on this seminar works is that I am sharing the purpose. The purpose is really to get us to think critically about res what respectability is and how it affects the lives of black women and girls. And so the, the second thing that we're going to do is look at a, a video presentation. Um, then we're going to talk about some terms and concepts. And the most critical and important part of this presentation is not the information that we're going to deliver, but it's how you will reflect upon and apply the information to your life. And then we'll have closing comments. Just a couple of things about how BB and I have prepared to pre present. I am a teacher educator. What that means is that I expect engagement from my audience as we present. So if you, um, when I ask questions, I'm hoping that you will, will answer them. If not, I'm calling you. So we're gonna move forward. So first, I would please like everyone to take a moment and if you're able, gaze upon what's on the screen, look at what's on the screen and think about what do you see? What are any images or messages that might be portrayed on the screen? Um, what is, how does this make you feel? Um, anyone want to take a stab at it? Mm-hmm. Okay, so head without a face and vacant underneath. Anyone else? Mm hmm. It's like angel wings. Angel wings? Okay. Mm hmm. Oh, God. So tummy and some legs and the words out of control, yes? Almost see the word feet on the top left. Mm. Mm. And also a skeletal figure to the right of a faceless person. Mm. And then what somebody said was butterfly, you look like a little pin. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay, so
so maybe if a little PM tubes, the word hate, um, the skeletal figure. Mm -hmm. I see the word V, right? Mm, v in French, right? Okay, anyone else? Mm. Mm -hmm. I sort of see a flower on the right, a lot of sort of mirrors, the empty face on the left, but it feels like the, the, the more joyful part of the image as I experience it. Mm. A flower, okay, maybe mirroring joy. Um, why do you think that this image might have been specifically chosen um, in this context? To confuse us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, to confuse you. Maybe to probe your imagination, your creative thinking. Anyone else? <laughs> So kind of a conglomerate of diverse images that maybe women feel. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe also a conglomerate of like how society is mm. So both like how you go on the inside, but what the outside. So maybe like how society views women and also which society, you know, are these maybe the opinions of? Anyone else? Mm -hmm. are all really great observations and that's definitely something that if you can please try and keep that in mind as we continue with the presentation thinking about this image and maybe if you see it on other slides and kind of keeping those ideas with you and kind of continuing to maybe hopefully not confuse but probe <laughs> your imagination some more. So now what we're going to watch is a video um, by someone you may have heard, Beyonce. Um, she is, as I'm sure most of you may know, an artist, and in this particular video, um, she's really kind of forwarding some ideas that are really powerful ideas about the impacts of societal views of beauty on women, and especially on her, um, and in her life as a woman of color. And so really just think about what am I observing? What are some salient features of this video? How can they apply to the cross-cultural ways in which we can view body politics and respectability? So let's just spend a few minutes um, talking about the video, what are some of the things that you noticed or that stood out to you in this particular video? chose this video is because you're right she does really try to challenge the notions of beauty but she's in a unique position where she is considered to be one of the most beautiful not black women but just women in our country so in terms of like what that means to her and what she goes through and then you can think about what that means to the average person everyday person who looks nothing like Beyonce and so that some of the imagery um, that you saw was the pageantry. The pageant is like the most, I guess, strategically placed polit body politics where you have to look a certain way and you have to have a certain ideas. And if you notice in the video, when he asked her what her aspirations in life, it totally stumped her. And it pretty much wrung down her whole worldview, her view of herself and how she saw the world. The most significant part 
of the video to me was the end when you saw the young Beyonce. And she, what did she say at the end? Thank you for what? Choosing me. Think about what that means. Thank you for choosing me. Not thank you for recognizing the talent that I have. Thank you for choosing me because we all want to be chosen. Right? Is that true? We all want to be chosen, but we have to think about the ways in which our bodies are controlled, policed, um, regulated, about who can be chosen, who can be picked. And this, that is one of the main reasons that we chose this particular video. Okay, so now keeping those ideas in mind, we're gonna talk about culture. So culture can be customs, it is habits, beliefs, and values that shape emotions, behavior, and life patterns. And that can become more and more intertwined and complex when you really go into intersectional identities, right? And then culture may include language, modes of thinking, and fundamental views of reality. Um, and so if we look to the right, can anyone try and tell me what this image is of? An iceberg, exactly, yes. Um, so if you look here, you'll see what can be referred to as the cultural iceberg. So it's this idea that there are things that are more overt and noticeable to the common observer um, above the surface, and then there are things that are deeper, that are maybe a little more covert, a little more subconscious, that are harder to outright call out. So some of those things above the surface would be things like flags, food, festivals, fashion, holidays, language, performances, and dances, things where you're attending these events or you're eating these um, types of food and you are usually making conscious choices about the things that you're participating in. And then underneath the surface, there are ways you communicate, like facial expressions and gestures and one's tone of voice, notions of friendship and leadership, concepts of fairness and justice and of time, um, attitudes towards elders in a culture or society, um, adolescents, uh, rules and expectations that members of that society or culture may hold, um, and then also approaches to a religion or a courtship, um, a marriage, raising children, problem solving, decision making. These are things that kind of guide our decisions to maybe go to festivals or to um, uphold so certain dances or languages because they're important to our cultures, right? And then if we look over to the right, kind of continuing with that vein, you'll see things that are observable above the surface, like behaviors, and again, that's going toward things that are more conscious decisions that we make every day, every hour, in ways that we are doing or choose to not do identity work and identify with the culture of society. And then you have things below the surface as well that are not observable, or at least harder to observe, which are interpretations. So the way that we feel at our core, the way that we act in specific situations, like in the workplace or in a social setting, core values, things that we learn are good or bad, right or wrong, desirable or undesirable, acceptable or unacceptable. Um, and then under that, we also have formative factors, basically saying that these are forces that create, define, and also mold a culture's core values, and therefore the people in that culture as well. And so as we start to think specifically about body politics, respectability, um, and how women of color, specifically black women, women of the African diaspora, how they're looked at um, by cultures that they claim are their own, and then also by mainstream culture, um, by white culture in America, how that kind of plays into everything. Um, so what is meant by body politics? Body politics refers to practices and, po and policies through which powers of society regulate the human body, right? And it's seen, and the body is, is socially shaped, it's colonized, and it's seen as sites where social constructions of differences are mapped onto human beings. It is um, subject to systematic regimens, like by our government. What can we do with our bodies? You know, do we have control over our bodies? And then, 
the politically inspired practices that are shaped laws and containment and control, like our reproductive rights, those types of things fall within the vein of body politics. In terms of the body, with this in mind, the body is placed in this kind of hierarchical dichotomy. Either the body is what? Masculine or feminine. It can't be both, right? Either you are a male or a female. Um, either it's the, oh, sorry. the mind or the body, right? If we know anything about psychology and physiology, we're both. It's not either or, we're both. Either you can be smart or you can be pretty. Able-bodied or disabled. So it's still this, this, either you're on this side of the totem pole or you're on that side. To be fat or skinny, right? To be heterosexual or homosexual. Young or old, black or white, pretty or ugly. These are different type, ways in which body politics affects us and affects how we think about ourselves, how we just simply be in the world. So with that in mind, how do you think body politics impacts the lives of black women and girls? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Mm-hmm. So maybe kind of like this unfairness in the way that people are treated, even though there are clear regulations that should across the board be applied to everyone, no matter their identity. Okay, anyone else? So thinking about body image, um, what does it encompass? Beliefs, memories, encompasses assumption and generalizations about one's own, their own body, someone's body, um, otherwise thought of as a body schema, and then also feelings about one's body type, their height, their weight, their body mass index, their shape, and the individual body parts, which counts as body self-esteem or body esteem, and then the sense of uh, control over one's body, their physical sensibility, um, and thinking about how based upon you know, the things that were outlined and the dichotomies that society continues to afford and say that you have to be one or the other, you can't be a combination of both. Um, it can get pretty complex and then adding on to that intersectional um, identities and then keeping in mind the socio-political environment of, of whatever society or culture you're talking about and then the greater mainstream culture that's associated with prestige at the time. Um, those things can get very, conflated, there can be a lot of misunderstanding, and definitely um, assumption by someone about themselves because of ideals that they've been made to believe about their own body, but then the assumptions of other people about those people as well. So I grew up, um, my grandmother used to always tell us, pictures are worth a thousand words, right? You can say more in a picture than you can with words. So these two pictures, what do you see? I Love My Body Campaign by Victoria's Secret. So this particular campaign, it was just, you know, one of Victoria's Secret said, well, you know, we have been, you know, criticized for not showing diverse bodies, right? So their solution was to come up with I Love My Body Campaign. But, do they show diverse bodies? No. They show what? Diverse colors of bodies. <laughs> but they don't even really. They threw in two black girls, they were like, that's enough. <laughs> um, then the Dove um, company came behind them and said, okay, Victoria's Secret, you have it all wrong. We're going to show you what real bodies look like. So they came up with the real beauty campaign. 
What do you see in those in that image? Right, because my body is clearly not on there. Yeah, I don't care about that too. Mm -hmm. And then even with that, we're seeing what what appears to be able-bodied people. Mm -hmm. They're still um, they're still not that that representation doesn't go as far mm -hmm. as all bodies. Okay. They're all relatively young. They're all young, so there are no older women. Jenny. Right, okay. And even the top, they have, even though they're women, they still have, they look like um, pre-adolescent girls in terms of the development, right? So they really don't have a lot of breast and butt and all that types of stuff. Yes? They don't show any women, that's a differently able or Right. And even all the women, there's no really um, diversity in terms of the presentation. It's all the traditional feminine mm -hmm. bodies, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So with the hair, even with the, the undergarments, like boy shorts and things like that, and think, you know, so there's still not a lot of diversity. So in terms of like, when we're thinking about like how society is trying to change and become more uh, culturally competent and be more accepting, we still have a long ways to go. Research often tells us that black girls, right, do not feel the pressure to look thin and relate to the white feminine idea. The idea, the belief is that black girls tend to look more toward each other as their feminine ideals. However, this research does not keep in mind that the black feminine ideal is still based on Eurocentric white mainstream values of pretty, right? And so a lot of times, the what's acceptable in communities for people of African descent is looked down upon. But when it's presented in mainstream society, it is valued. In this image, what do you see? Two hairstyles, same hairstyles, right? But black girls are punished and mocked for their originality, while others profit from their creations. If anyone knows this, this is what we call gel down baby hairs, right? So when you would take your hair when you, um, and you would gel it down and look real smooth, and, and most people's like, oh, that's real ghetto. But on a white girl, it's high fashion. Think about Kim Kardashian, what she does. She is really cultural appropriation where she takes a lot of things that are highly valued in black communities and uses them and becomes rich off of them. So thinking about racial body politics, and not just the body, but including race, including more, more kind of complexity to the phenotype, right? Thinking about the attribution of ethical, moral, temperamental, and social characteristics to individuals or populations based upon skin color, facial features, body types, and sexual anatomy figure. Um, and a lot of that, as we've kind of discussed, does 
leave people out maybe if they have different uh, abilities or maybe if they have you know different religious affiliations that may al allow them or they choose to present themselves differently that aren't represented um, even when campaigns try to be inclusive um, and then you have the devaluation hypersexualization and commodification of black and brown female bodies and just some of the ways that those can be seen are through enslavement um, and specifically through the enslavement of Africans as well as others um, historically and then human sex trafficking historically and contemporary because it still occurs which is such an atrocity um, and the same with enslavement as well and then also media um, and the way that um, certain media platforms portray bodies and I think um, it can be really interesting to look at companies like Victoria's Secret and Dove and think okay who's in charge who are the people that are in charge of approving these campaigns um, and thinking about you know if I look at People magazine or Seventeen magazine or Vogue or a magazine that's maybe affiliated with mainstream white culture and if it's forwarding for women it's forwarding for one specific type of woman thinking about you know if I look at a jet or if I look at an essence if I look at some different type of media, am I still going to see those same images being pushed forward or am I going to see different images accepted? And unfortunately, as Dr. Lindsay Dennis said, a lot of the time, um, and I have felt this in my community at home as well, that even though I may be trying to compare myself to another person of color, it's still based upon Eurocentric standards. And that's something that's just in our subconscious and a lot of times we don't know how to articulate it. And unfortunately, as I've experienced and seen among my friends at home, sometimes that really builds a lot of contention between people and they don't know how to understand it. So that really drives rifts within a community that on one hand wants to really forward diverse images together, but then it kind of ends up being torn apart because of things that are really hard to explain because it's been so intergenerationally implemented in our minds that we need to adhere to a certain ideal um, that we don't necessarily know how to articulate. Okay, so now we have more. Again, pictures are worth a thousand words. So Patricia Hill Collins has this concept, it's called controlling stereotypical images of black women, in which black women have historically been seen as the mammy, the Jezebel, the sapphire, the strong black woman. And so we, we, are, we see these images being duplicated and disseminated in our society over and over and over again. And it sends us, whether we are conscious or not, subconscious messages about who black women and girls are, how they're expected to behave. And when we see these behaviors displayed, we, we are quick to, to judge it, right? So if we look at this particular image, I love pancakes, everybody knows, he knows I love pancakes, but I do not like his pancake box. This pancake box, H Mama, is based on the mammy stereotype. The mammy was the, was the stereotype of the, the woman who was enslaved who dedicated her whole life to servitude and to making sure that her enslavers were happy and that their children were taken care of. And when we see this image over and over again, we'll see it here in this particular movie where Monique is um, playing a mother, still same type of attitude, asexual, but she's still judged, right? When we see that scarf, it means what? The man, right? And so we'll see these images over and over again. This particular image right here is Venus Hottentot, which is a depiction of Sarah Bartman. Who knows who Sarah Bartman is? Okay, Yo, tell us who Sarah Bartman is. She was a woman who was put in a cage and put on display in France, I believe, um, in the 19th century. Yeah. So we have these uh, world fairs. Who remembers world fairs? Like even if you go to a fair now, I remember going to a fair when I was a little girl. They're like the smallest woman in the world. It'd be this little short woman in there cussing people out. She was really mean. But they used to actually put people on display. And they put her on display because of her body parts. She was her she had really large breasts and a large buttocks. And even after she died, they actually cut her body up 
and put it on display in Paris in a museum. And it wasn't until the year 2000 where they actually took her body parts off display and sent them back home to South Africa for a proper burial. So it's this, this image of she's highly sexual. Like, look at her body, look at her butt. And we see it over and over and over again. And my generation, little Kim, in today's generation, Cardi B, is this hypersexualized image where black girls and women are seen as body parts. Even in this image, it depicts a, a slaveholder who has an enslaved woman, and what do you see her body parts? When during periods of enslavement, women who had you, who were considered to be have childbearing hips, be very curvaceous, were sold for more money. They brought in more funds because they believed that those women would be able to bear more children. They were seen as breeders, so they were more valuable to their enslavers. And so this idea of women are, black women are either the ancient mama figure, they're um, the Venus hiding type, the over-sexualized, are this one right here, the angry black woman, right? So if, like, I've talked about with my hands, I've talked with my hands my whole entire life. I probably came to the world like, ah! <laughs> so even now, because we use a lot of gestures when we talk, it's, she's angry. But when you see this woman and this woman, same gesture, hands up. One is projected in what? A spirit uh, almost like praise and another one is angry. So to say if we had this same woman and turned her backwards, would we still say that she was angry? No, but it's in our mind as soon as we see her facing us, like she's angry. This image of the angry black woman. So these are some of the ways in which the images, the imagery, the body politics affects black women and girls. So continuing on, what are the ways in which racial body politics impacts the lives of black women and girls? Any thoughts? Other ways that we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, when you talk about cultural appropriation, there's, like, almost, I don't want to say two sides, but it's just not the two sides. It's like, on one hand, they are making, there's a lot of blaming made off of looking in the way a black girl looks. But additionally, then it enforces the stereotype that black girls look a certain way when black women are not a monolith. And we are not all shaped the same. We do not all speak the same. We do not all have the same hair type. And when, when, um, when influencers um, take certain parts of black culture and they they um, they profit off of them. They help to to say that this is what all black women are. This is what all black women look like. I like that you talked about, um, although it's unfortunate, this idea of picking certain parts, right? So picking and choosing. Like I wanna be, I wanna enhance this feature because it's going to make me look good based off of another culture's normalcy, right? What's considered to be normal in their culture. But then when there are other things that come along with it, I don't wanna take those, right? So I would like to have, you know, enhanced breasts or enhanced butt, but I don't wanna get pulled over. You know, I would like to be able to have, you know, it illustrious, right, lips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> lips, and I would love to have illustrious, like, dreads and braids, right, but I don't want to be followed in the store. So, you know, I want to talk and say, you know, lit and on fleek, but I don't want to be assumed to be speaking a stigmatized dialect, right? So there are things that we, we pick and choose, which is really interesting. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Yes, I completely agree. And the idea that it's not a monolith, the culture is not monolithic, right? And also, like, black women walking around, being aware of these stereotypes and being, like, super conscious about which stereotypes people are projecting onto them, especially depending on where you are and what areas you frequent. Like, some people are going to project certain of those images on you, and that affects how you act around the mm. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I just want to piggyback without off what you said. It is different. Our two people in the audience said regionally. Um, I'm a Southern black woman, and I grew up in the South, and I was surrounded, and I didn't realize that my blackness was just a part of who I am. It wasn't really a salient part of my life because I everyone looked like me. I could walk into the room and not worry about why they looking at me. And when I moved to New England, I became the blackest in my life because my blackness is constantly, you know, commented on. Oh, you're, I was in Target the other day. I had just got my hair done. And this um, Caucasian woman comes up. Your hair is so cool. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get it. It's a compliment. But, you know, I like your hair. Like, would you say that to another, uh, a white woman? Oh, you would just say, you have a very nice haircut. Or I like your hair color. Not, your hair is so cool. Like, go away. And I really looked, did look at her like, go away. And so this idea of that, when you're in, and so it's not only when we're in, in, society, in spaces where we're in the minority, but it also happens in spaces where we're in the majority. And it's called respectability. Um, respectability has to do with when marginalized people they police their own members right they have these values of these often unattainable expectations that are often based on mainstream values that we use to police our own I give you an example my grandmother is 89 years old I love her I love her death I've had my hair in locks for 11 years Every time I go visit, we ain't gonna get rid of them things out your head. Never. <laughs> um, how do they do that? It's, it's my hair grandma. But even people often tell me, oh, are you gonna cut your dreads? No, they'll cut them when I die. <laughs> it's just this idea of, that we have to police our own. So this quote right here gives you a lot of, you know, some things to think about are like really salient ways in which respectability shows up in different cultures. There's a lot of respectability politics in general in the black community. A lot of poverty shaming, right? A lot of slut shaming. It just naturally happens because the black community for so long has been in the struggle for survival and for so long had to choose the best representative in order for us to shine. So you have to be, it's like when you walk out the door, you're not just, I'm not representing LaShonda. I'm representing my family, all the black people that I know, all the people that, all the black people who have died, who are yet to be born, is that pressure is put. And where we choose, we have to choose the best representation of who we are and put them in the front. So here we have two different images of two women, and they're both doing the same thing in this moment. They're both emphatic about something and they're trying to relay a message to someone, either through the phone or in person. And to the left, you have someone who would be considered as ghetto or would be labeled as a hood rat by mainstream culture, black and white. Um, and that, again, goes into self-policing. Um, and then on the right, you have Stacey Dash from Clueless. Um, and they're both doing the same thing, trying to convey a message right in an emphatic way. But one has the negative, the stigmatized connotation um, because of her features. And the other, um, because of her features, or maybe also because of the way she chooses to identify with her racial identity or to not identify with it, um, she is perceived less, in a, in a less stigmatized way. She's perceived as someone who has more poise. Um, she is perceived as someone who can articulate better. Um, when really, and I'm a linguistics nerd, so I'm gonna slip this in. Um, because in this picture, it'd probably be assumed, right, oh, one of them might be speaking African-American English. One of them might be speaking a dialect that's stigmatized, and the other one who has more presumably white friends in the movie is shown conforming 
through certain ideals and through certain behaviors to mainstream white society and also maybe trying to suppress some of the ways that she's been looked down upon, possibly by her own community, as I know so many people have. Um, and she might speak in a way that makes her seem more prestigious. She might hang around people that makes her seem more prestigious. And these are all things that we can make in just a quick snap by looking at these pictures and just trying to assume the background of these women's lives simply by this one image. Just one more comment before the image. Um, and also in terms of if you look at these images, we see these images over and over again, and they are embedded in our subconscious mind. And whether we know it or not, it creates this implicit bias when we see young black girls and women acting in these ways, and we make judgments about who they are and what they can do and what they can be in life. So as we go to kind of leave you with these questions, we want you to think about how does body politics and respectabilities show up in your world? So if you think about yourself, like most of us, we could relate to some parts of Beyonce's pretty hurt story. We could relate to the body politics that we talked about in terms of being beautiful, but how does it show up in your world? Can anybody think answer that? How does body politics and respectability show up in your day-to-day -day life? So I wore my hair in braids, so extensions, um, since sixth grade through high school, through my freshman year, to, through last year. Um, I had my hair in braids and then halfway through my, my first year, I decided to stop wearing braids because first I felt really inspired being here and seeing a lot of black black girls who did not um, have to put their hair in braids and like left their hair out. And because I went to a predominantly white high school, I didn't see that very often. But when I decided to stop doing my hair, my father, who is of another generation, he's a baby boomer, um, saw that I was done <laughs> with braids for the moment. He would always ask me, when are you gonna comb your hair? When are you gonna get your hair done? Are we gonna go get your hair done this weekend? No, we're not gonna get my hair done. My hair is done. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's finished. I've done what I'm doing with it. Um, and it's still a fight we have. He doesn't like it when my mom cut her hair. Um, and my mom went natural. She used to perm her hair all the time. And so to me, as a child, um, beautiful hair was when my mom went to the, the hair salon and got her hair permed and they took it out of the curlers and they straightened it for her. And I was like, wow, I can't wait for me to be a grown person at 16. Mind you, I'm six, like that's grown to me, 16. And I can get my hair permed and I'm gonna look so pretty. Like I've had that instilled in me for so long and then coming to Wellesley, even though we don't have a very large black community, it was still so much more than what I was used to at, in, in high school um, that it shaped my ideas like that. Anyone else? <laughs> um, I can definitely um, share your sentiment because my hair is something that I struggle with every day. And feeling like my hair, my hair looks nice, I feel beautiful. If my hair doesn't look nice, I'm very self-conscious. So um, I think for me every day would be my hair and also my body image. Um, making sure that things are covered up so that I look presentable so people aren't staring at me. Even though it could just be me, you know, feeling that self-consciousness about myself. The second question has to do with how do your beliefs about the res body and respectability present, present themselves when you're interacting with black women and girls? I would say uh, I've been, I'm a graduate of Wellesley and actually totally embarrassed by the fact that I was so ignorant about all this stuff. To my graduation, I decided to have my hair cornrowed honestly having no idea that that was cultural appropriation at age 22. I've grown a fair amount since then. Um, but for before coming back to work here about a year ago, I was working for six years in Roxbury, doing a lot of youth development. And I do remember sometimes feeling really challenged, like having to have like the internal conversation as I was talking to young women who were, you know, dressed 
in a really sexualized way that would make me incredibly uncomfortable if it were my own daughter or whatever. And I would just have to be like, okay, stop that. You know, like, that's your, Nancy, that's your problem. Address this young woman as she is. She's just talking to you. She's just coming to you. And, okay. You know, but it was like a, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of, like, shush that part of you up, you know. Thank you for sharing that. Growing up, I was always very self-conscious of like how my mom and my grandma saw women who dressed provocatively or in a sexualized manner. And like as I went out into the world, I had to really stop myself from associating those types of images with like poorer people or people who are quote quote ghetto or like don't have as much money as me. And like becoming friends with people at Wellesley and like having these conversations, it's kind of interesting how, especially when you like have a good education and you come to a place like this, you don't realize how much you're putting down other people in your community. Um, and just really having to like fight that every time I see um, images, especially like in movies, like Tyler Perry movies or any other kind of like black media that really like reaches out there, like what those images are presenting and like how I feel about them and to not like actively judge just because I don't present myself like that. I can remember, um, when I was growing up, my grandmother and my mother saying that only whores and prostitutes wore red lipstick. And so now I still, like, red lipstick is in and I still struggle with it. Like, oh my God, no! So <laughs> this is kind of internal fight with myself. Um, and then the last question up here, what strategies um, do you currently use to monitor and address your beliefs about body politics and respectability? I think just for me personally, like if I find myself wanting to make a comment about another person's body, I usually just don't. <laughs> like, um, and then I try to think to myself, like, well, why do I want to make that comment? Is it constructive? I, it's just me. Thank you. Any other strategies that people? Well, we're to the close. Um, are, is there any? Oh, you had a comment. Oh, I did. Okay. Oh, oh, we're, this is, we're at the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say a lot. The way I personally do it is read, read up. If something <laughs> like, if um, I see something that says, oh, that's if I say something and somebody's like, that's problematic if you say that. Um, instead of sitting there and being like, well, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I try to do my best to educate myself as much as possible so that. I just try to tell, like, um, educate myself as much as possible on things and remind myself that a lot of the things that I think are ingrained in me through not only society but how I was raised. And I'm just constantly checking myself. I have children in my life that are different races, and I, um, I'll make sure and I'll remind the others, the other adults in my family, not to uh, give discipline to one differently than another. You know, because one is louder than the other. You know, if the children who are brown skin are loud, well, so are the children who are white. So don't just comment on that. Little little things like that that just be much more mindful. I feel like having a conversation, like listening a lot to people in the teenage years has been incredibly helpful mm -hmm. to understand. Especially I do feel like other generations, the next gen, or whatever, or like three generations from me, teenagers, mm -hmm. but anyway, mm -hmm. really different points of view depending on where they, mm -hmm. especially if they've grown up in a pretty diverse environment. Right, right. Yeah, one strategy that I use when I'm working with young people is judge in your head, not out loud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when they say something shocking like, Respond only in your head. <laughs> because if you respond like your face, they're never going to talk to you again. They're never going to share their true experiences. And you're going to lose their trust. And so, and then just being able to say, you know what? I said, I thought about something that I said to you about your hair or your body, and I apologize. 
I mean, you know, it may have offended you, but that wasn't my intention. The human side of us, the apology, that willingness to have conversations that are difficult can help us to kind of move past a lot of these things and not just ignoring them or acting like they didn't happen or acting like we didn't see it. And, you know, that will go a long way just to say I'm sorry. Um, those are some of the strategies that we can use like really in our day-to-day -day life. Because a lot of times when I do presentations, it's like all this great data, but it's like, what do we do with that, right? <laughs> and so it's important to bring in that human element and take the information and, and break it down in ways that people can digest and apply to their daily